Hello everyone, Josh here with Horrors and History. I just wanted to say thanks so much to all those who have subscribed so far. You all are the biggest motivation here that's keeping this channel going. There are many more great topics in mind that we are very much looking forward to sharing with you in the coming episodes. So, thanks again, and I hope you enjoy this newest episode of Horrors and History. Today, when someone tells us they'll be going under the knife, it's often delivered as a sort of tongue-in-cheek, dark humor comment, suggesting that their skilled operating surgeon will soon be cutting into them, no different than when a butcher cuts open a pig, preparing its meat for the nearest supermarket. However, in reality, a patient undergoing surgery in a modern hospital setting can take some comfort in knowing that the procedure will be virtually pain-free during the operation, and in many cases, the patient will be kept asleep so as to avoid the experience altogether. They'll then be left to wake some time later, dressed in clean, sterile bandages, and kept under close, monitored watch, while being offered food and refreshment as they recover. Although this is not to say that even with all of our medical advancements of today, that being told by your doctor that surgery may be a necessity in treating an illness or injury, does not still manifest a sense of dread or fear when being faced with giving complete control of your very life and well-being to someone who will be soon cutting you open. But an injury as simple and straightforward as a small bone break, say in one's leg, could be a relatively easy fix with few complications in today's world. But just a couple of hundred years ago, a broken leg could very well mean your time was up. And not necessarily at the fault of the injury itself, but that of the doctors, who was meant to be treating it. For in the Victorian age of medicine, the practice of surgery to treat injured or ailing patients was still in its infancy, only beginning to see advancements. However, it was often tragic misfortune to find oneself under the knife in the Victorian operating theater. A true horror in history. Let's create a scenario. The year is 1836. One day, a working class Englishman in London is constructing a new dry dock in the shipping yard by the Thames. We'll call him Mr. Halstead. As Mr. Halstead works, a large piece of timber falls loose, too quickly for the busy man to properly avoid. The heavy timber comes down on his leg, crushing it. It's revealed that his leg is broken, badly. Upon further inspection with the help of his co-workers, Mr. Halstead sees that the broken bone is now protruding through the skin. He's whisked away to the nearest hospital. With Mr. Halstead being a dock worker in 1830s London, he would be lucky to make 18 shillings, or just under a pound per week, translating to just over 90 pounds today, at an average weekly income of around 620 pounds for the modern British citizen. Mr. Halstead, therefore, is barely scraping by. In such cases for patients at a Victorian hospital during this time, they would likely not be able to afford treatment for illness or injury. However, as surgery was in a revolutionary phase during the 1800s, there were many eager students who would jump at the chance to sit in on a demonstration by a skilled surgeon. Thus, if Mr. Halstead would be inclined to have an audience, an operation may in fact be feasible despite his financial shortcomings. So in this case, we'll say that Mr. Halstead is in luck, and a surgery is therefore scheduled. Our injured dock worker would then have been brought up to the upper floors of the hospital, where he would have been taken into a large room, lit only by natural light pouring in from a skylight in the ceiling, or a few windows in the walls. Circling around would be dozens if not hundreds of seats, practically stacked on top of each other, rising up, forming a pit-like setting. These seats would be filled with waiting medical students, professional contemporaries, and perhaps even a few morbidly curious laymen off the street who paid their way in to witness a live surgery. Many were just hoping to see what new technological innovations were being made in the medical field. It truly was a theatrical experience, if there ever was one. In position on the floor in the center of this conservatively lit room was a small raised table surrounded by sawdust. A steady-handed surgeon certainly did not want to be slipping on spilled blood while holding a sharp object. Mr. Halstead would be placed on the table in a tourniquet wrapped tightly above the amputation area, 
Unfortunately for Mr. Halstead, he would not have had any form of anesthesia at this point, for it was rarely ever used during this time. In fact, many physicians believe that loss of consciousness during a surgical procedure was actually dangerous and so the patient should be kept awake, as many also felt that pain aided in the healing process. Furthermore, while the patient may understandably demand something for the pain, the best that could be done was usually the administration of opium, alcohol, or simply having the patient bite down on something. However, drugs and alcohol were often shirked by surgeons during operations, so many people would just deal with the pain of procedures including amputations. The first documented use of medical anesthesia in the 1800s wouldn't occur until 1846, when Boston dentist T.G. Morton administered sulfuric ether to a man requiring a tumor extraction from his neck. Though ether came with its own drawbacks, especially the fact that it was highly explosive. So given the terrifying experience Mr. Halstead was about to face, he undoubtedly would be hoping for it to end as soon as possible. Maybe he would be fortunate enough to find himself under the care of one Dr. Liston. Dr. Robert Liston was a Scottish surgeon who came to practice his trade in London after a brief stint in Edinburgh. An extraordinarily tall man for his time, at six feet two inches, Dr. Liston was as egotistical as he was skilled. Upon entering the operation theater, he would often gesture to his colleagues sitting in front row and say, Time me, gentlemen. Time me. For Dr. Liston was known as the fastest knife in the West End. He would use his large stature to loom over the terrified patient, his strength so great it was said, that he would use his left hand alone as a tourniquet, while his other hand gripped his razor-sharp, affably named Liston knife. And from the time of first incision to the last suture, the good doctor was reportedly able to complete an amputation in under 60 seconds, to much applause and praise, as the bloody patient on the table attempted to regain their wits as they surely writhed in pain. Though Dr. Liston was not without his faults, during one amputation procedure, as he hurriedly reached for another instrument while he clenched his knife between his teeth, as he was wont to do, he went to cutting through the patient's legs so swiftly that he mistakenly also removed one of their testicles in the process. In another unfortunate incident caused by his rapid surgical momentum, Liston amputated a patient's limb while also removing the fingers from his assistant. And because the operating theater would sometimes become so crowded that the floor would often have to be cleared for space, a spectator's coat was cut by Liston as he was swapping instruments. His patient would go on to die of infection from the operation as would his fingerless assistant, and the spectator whose coat was slashed was said to have died from fright on the spot. It is the only documented case of a surgery with a 300% mortality rate. Serendipity, however, does not grace the poor Mr. Halstead with the swift hands of the extraordinary Dr. Liston. Instead, in walks a young and ambitious yet relatively unknown surgeon with a lot to prove. He rolls up his shirt sleeves and adorns himself with a worn apron, stiff with dried blood, pus, and other bodily fluids, something we today would find disgusting and unsanitary. But in the Victorian era of the heroic surgeon, such surgical attire was worn by some as a badge of honor, presenting a tangible display of the surgeon's experience. Likewise, instruments were typically only cleaned after a surgery took place, carrying any number of germs before being put to use on patients. The young surgeon was unlikely to keep himself clean either. The introduction and use of surgical gloves would not occur until the late 1800s, and many surgeons would often jump between other surgeries or examining cadavers for research purposes before arriving to perform procedures on new patients so there would be no telling what germs or bacteria were festering beneath the fingernails and on the skin of Mr. Halstead's surgeon. Nonetheless, the operation would proceed. With no anesthesia or pain medicine, Mr. Halstead would likely be held down by the surgeon's assistance, and at most, given a wooden trowel or perhaps a piece of leather to bite down on as their best offer of pain management. The surgeon would likely take up a common falciform knife, a curved reverse-bladed instrument, over Dr. Liston's iconic straight knife and maneuver his arm under Mr. Halstead's knee, positioning the blade at the point of incision, a technique of the time called the surgeon's cut. 
From there, ideally in one motion, a large circular incision would be made, separating the flesh and muscle from the bone. Once the bone was exposed, a surgical saw would be produced, and again, hopefully in as few motions as possible for the patient's sake, the bone would be sawed in half. But Mr. Halstead's terrible ordeal is not yet over. Now comes the time for rest and recuperation, a near impossibility in a Victorian hospital. For most of the 19th century, the cause of infection in wounds or otherwise was primarily thought to be from bad air, as it was put. So hospitals could only just ventilate their rooms, with the hope that fresh air would curb the onset of infection in recovering patients. Though there remained a smell of literal death due to the cadavers kept on hospital grounds, which doctors sardonically yet proudly referred to as good old hospital stink. The beds the patients laid in would be considered downright hazardous for a medical setting by today's standards. It wouldn't be surprising while recovering with a recently bandaged and sutured wound to share your sheets with mold and even insects. In fact, Victorian hospitals would staff exterminators who, if you can believe it, were actually paid more than the surgeons. Their responsibility would be to rid any number of insects in the hospital, including the dreaded bed bug. For the now bedridden Mr. Halstead, his chances of recovery, much less survival, were slim. Tragically, the survival rate of amputations during the Victorian era was only around 50%, most succumbing to infection after the operation. In addition to the doctors, few other hospital staff ever washed their hands or wore gloves, and even the operating table itself could harbor infectious germs, given that they were duly used for anatomizing the dead. So in the case of our poor Mr. Halstead, the hospital bed would most likely be where his story ends, falling prey to the onset of gangrene, followed by sepsis. In the reality of 19th century healthcare, you either survived an operation or you didn't. There was no in-between. Though chances were greater for those who had the money to call surgeons to their own homes, as there was more control over the environment, such as having clean bedding to recover in, and fewer germs to come in contact with. By the mid-1800s, anesthesia finally began to gain ground with medical professionals. The aforementioned ether was initially being used by the aristocracy for recreation at parties called ether frolics, wherein some physicians noted the pain-relieving properties of the substance, yet little was ever formally published on these findings. Some of us may have been administered nitrous oxide, or laughing gas, for painful dental procedures. This euphoria-inducing gas was concocted by teenage chemist Humphrey Davy, though he too never published his findings on its mitigative properties for pain, instead using it for a quick buzz, privately sharing it with his literary friends who liked to muse over philosophical ideas while under its influence. Though gradually, these early forms of anesthesia found their way into operating rooms. In regards to stopping the spread of infection, a major breakthrough occurred in the 1860s when Dr. Joseph Lister rejected the widely believed bad air theory for the cause of wound infection Instead, correctly postulating that it was in fact bacteria causing patients to incur gangrene, and ultimately sepsis. Dr. Lister went to work experimenting with antiseptics and found a promising solution in carbolic acid, which at the time was already being used in the maintenance of sewer systems. The mortality rate in his hospital ward dropped from the expected 50% to an astounding 15% following his new antiseptic practices, which allowed for limb preservation following injury, rather than amputation. Dr. Lister's introduction of germ theory to operating tables and application of antiseptic to the surgery process laid the groundwork for modern medicine, as his ideas were adopted by virtually the entire medical community and hailed an exemplary advancement in the field. Further practices in the operating room followed that we today may more closely recognize. By the 1880s and 1890s, sterile surgical gowns, gloves, caps, and even some masks began to appear followed by a noted further reduction in infections from procedures. And the abolishment of the operating theater finally came in the early 20th century as germ theory continued to evolve, and physicians began to question if an operating room full of germ-carrying spectators was such a good idea. 
Another part of closing the operating theaters was simply because surgery was just not quite the spectacle it once was. With anesthesia now common, there was no longer a screaming, fidgeting patient to dramatize over, and the age of the heroic surgeon was at an end, as it was recognized that it wasn't showmanship and speed that determined whether or not a surgery would be successful, but instead the adherence to slower, more methodical incisions and proper sterilization that truly resulted in the healthy recovery of patients. It is difficult today, with all of our medical knowledge, to imagine a world where a trip to the hospital almost all but guarantees an untimely end to someone's life, where an easily treated injury to one's arm or leg today would have meant an agonizing, traumatic experience of suffering through the amputation of that limb, feeling every slice of the knife, every stroke of the saw, every poke and prick of the suture needle, followed by a feverish period of deep uncertainty where you're settled into the unwashed bedding of the previous patients, praying away the onset of infection as you scratch at the bites being inflicted upon you by the bugs you share your damp linens with. But such were the times of the Victorian era, where people did what they could with what knowledge they had. And while hospitals eventually started to be seen as the sanctuaries of medicine, offering hope to those in dire medical straits, it was a grim road paved in blood, pus, terror, and tears that led the way to where modern surgery is today, a road that began in the Victorian operating theater, making it a true horror in history. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. Thanks for watching Horrors in History.